Welcome back. What we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at the mechanism of, of an enzyme. It's complex four. It's called cytochrome C oxidase. And one thing I want to I want to talk about real quick before we go into any detail is there are several terms that we need to get straight. Okay. And I, I wanted to do, do this, and I'll do, I'll do this also in another video. And actually, let me, I'll do it in another video. I'll actually do it after this video. But let's define what an oxidase is. So if I have some molecule X, right, and it's going to start out reduced. And let's say my enzyme is an oxidase, right? Well, so you're going to end up with, X that's oxidized, right? And essentially what an oxidase is, is it's an enzyme that uses molecular oxygen and it uses it does an oxidation, but none of the oxygen atoms get incorporated into the molecule. They instead get lost as two waters. So let me say that again. An oxidase, by definition, is an enzyme that that oxidizes a molecule and it uses molecular oxygen to do so, but none of the oxygens get incorporated into the molecule. They instead get lost as water, in this case, two waters, right? Okay, and cytochrome C oxidase is an oxidase in every sense of the word. In another video, we'll also define monooxygenase and dioxygenase and the difference between those and oxygenases and mixed function oxidases and all that. Okay, but that's the topic of another video. Okay. So for now, what we'll do is we'll look at the mechanism of this. So recall from the last video that I had cytochrome C reduced with one electron. Okay. Well, cytochrome C is initially going to get oxidized back to its original form. And then this, of course, is going to go back to complex 3, right? It's going to go back to complex 3 and pick up another electron. Okay, right? But the initial electron acceptor is something we call, it is a bimolecular copper center. We designate it copper A. It's a bimolecular, a bimolecular copper A uh, cofactor. And it starts in the oxidized form, right? But initially it goes to the reduced form, right? Because it picked up the one electron, right? Well, then that's going to get oxidized back to its uh, back to its oxidized form, and it's going to be done so by something called a heme A, a heme A, and of course this is the oxidized version. So now we have heme A reduced, right? And then it's going to there's going to be another there's going to be another oxidation, and I'm running out of space here. Actually, no, I'm not. But anyways, we're going to have we'll start with another one. It's going to be heme A3. So it's a different heme A, so they designate it 3. And it's going to be, and again, this is in the oxidized form, and it's going to get reduced to heme A3 in the reduced form, right? And then, and then, this heme A3 is going to get, the electrons are going to move to a copper B cofactor. So here is oxidized copper B, and it's going to get reduced to copper B in the reduced form. Now, the next step I'm about to show you is a very important step. And in fact, this particular step is what they call the final electron transfer in the respiratory chain. And let me also say that this step, and in general, cytochrome C oxidase in general, is the rate determining step of the respiratory chain. And specifically, I believe it is this electron transfer that's the rate determining step. Okay? The electrons from the reduced copper B are ultimately going to go to oxygen. They're going to go to oxygen. And specifically, 
it is four electrons. So sequentially, and of course, remember that these electron transfers happen one at a time, so oxygen is going to pick up electrons one at a time, and ultimately it's going to pick up four electrons, right? And it's going to get converted to two waters, and then of course this is going to be oxidized back to copper B in the oxidized form like that. So I hope that makes sense, right? So let's look at what happened. It's not that difficult of a mechanism, I don't think, to understand, but cytochrome C is going to transfer electrons one at a time, first to copper A, then the electron fl flows to heme A, and then to heme A3, and then to copper B. And one thing I want to mention is that this whole group right here, that whole group right there has a special name, and it's called the iron copper center. So this whole sort of complex of heme A, heme A3, and copper B, those are all designated as the iron copper center. But that's beside the point. But oxygen is going to pick up electrons one at a time, and it's going to pick them up one at a time from copper B. And when it picks up a total of when it picks up a total of four electrons, it will be totally reduced to water. It'll be totally reduced to water. And in the process, for each electron transfer, copper B gets oxidized um, back to its oxidized form, right? So two water. So what, what, what is this? This is the terminal electron transfer. So now the question becomes, why is it that humans need oxygen? And this is your answer. Humans need oxygen because oxygen is the final electron acceptor. And you've probably heard this many times in the context of maybe an A&P class or a biology class. But this is the reason why. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. It's receiving the electrons from cytochrome B, or excuse me, copper B, copper B, but it's ultimately receiving them from cytochrome C through a series of electron transfers, okay? Now, what are the implications of this um, of this reaction? Well, it turns out that there are some molecules, some very dangerous molecules. One of them is cyanide. Another one of them is, is azide. You might use azide in a lab to kill bacteria. And the reason it kills bacteria, and actually another one I also mentioned is carbon monoxide, all of these molecules tend to inhibit this final electron transfer. They tend to inhibit it. So carbon monoxide, cyanide, azide, they're all going to get into this copper B center and block it. So think about what happens. If I block this final electron transfer, right, if I block this electron transfer, what's going to happen? Well, everything before it in the pathway stops, right? If I can't transfer this electron to oxygen, the whole cytochrome C oxidase shuts off. And so if that particular enzyme shuts off, complex 3 shuts off, and essentially this whole respiratory sh uh, chain dies, right? And that's all because I can't transfer this electron. So that's one reason why carbon monoxide is so dangerous. And in fact, that's how carbon monoxide kills you. It shuts off your respiratory chain by blocking the final electron transfer. Let's see. So what else is worth mentioning about this? Um, so let's think about this. So for every, for so no, basically, in order for, in order for one oxygen to be totally reduced, it needs four electrons. So let's think about this. So, so let's see, four, let's do this in, in blue. Actually, let's do it in white. Okay, so for one oxygen reduction, how many cytochrome C reductions do we need? We need four cytochrome C reductions, right? So let's think about this. In one cytochrome C reduction, how many um, how many ubiquinols was that? Well, let's think about it. So if we do some dimensional analysis, so we have one oxygen reduction, right? Right. 
So 1 O2 reduction is equal to 4 cytochrome C reductions, right? This cancels, right? And then so how many how many ubiquinols were necessary for one cytochrome C reduction? So for one cytochrome C reduction, for one cytochrome C reduction, well, we just needed one ubiquinol, right? That was part of the Q cycle. Remember, the, the ubiquinol electron split, and one went towards the top, or at least I drew it on the top, went towards the two iron, two sulfur center to the heme C1, and then ultimately to cytochrome C. So one... Ubiquinol. So we need one ubiquinol per cytochrome C reduction, right? So what do we see? Well, it turns out that for one oxygen reduction, so for one O2 reduction, we need four, four ubiquinols, right? For one oxygen reduction totally to water, or really it's to two waters, we need four ubiquinols, okay? So, I mean, that's just, that's, that's just basic dimensional analysis, but let's regroup a little bit. So, cytochrome C transfers electrons one at a time to copper A, and then to heme A, and then to heme A3, and then to copper B. And then the, the terminal electron transfer is between copper B and oxygen, and you end up generating two waters. And one thing I'll also mention, um, because it is worth mentioning, there are three waste products in, in mammals. One of them is carbon dioxide. Another one is one that we saw here, and that's water, right? And there's another one, another one that's ammonia. And at physiological pH, it'll exist as NH4 plus ammonium. So these right here, these three molecules are the three waste products of of humans and, and really of mammals in general. And actually, we haven't seen ammonia up to this point. And that, that ammonia is really the waste product in amino acid catabolism. But the CO2 we've seen, right? We saw that in isocitrate dehydrogenase. We saw it in alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. We've certainly seen it before. We saw water lost in enolase. Um, and we certainly seen it here. So these are the waste products in mammals and in, in metabolism in general. And so certainly it's a waste product here, and I want to just regroup real quick. I want to mention this, that this is an oxidase in every sense of the word. Remember, an oxidase is a molecule that performs an oxidation in which it uses molecular oxygen, and none of the oxygen molecules get incorporated into the molecule itself. It just gets lost as two waters. So I hope this video helped, and in the next video we'll take a look at the differences between the different kinds of oxygen using enzymes. See you in the next video. Welcome back. What I want to do in this video is explore the beta oxidation of a, 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 an unsaturated fatty acid and it's a, it's a poly unsaturated fatty acid and specifically it is linoleic acid. And of course it's going to be ligated to CoA. So essentially what we have is this. And it has a double bond at carbon number 9, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So it has 18 carbons, and it has double bonds specifically at carbons 9 carbons tw and carbon 12, and it has 18 carbons. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to really explore and, and figure out exactly how much of everything we're going to get from this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to abbreviate FADH2 as F, abbreviate NADH as N, and acetyl-CoA as A. So let's do one round of beta oxidation. In one round, I'm going to shorten it by two carbons. So that 9 is now going to be a 7. So it's, the double bond is going to be at carbon 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Right? So now this double bond is at carbon 7. This is carbon 10 and this is carbon 16, right? So I generate an FADH2, an NADH, and an acetyl-CoA. Fair enough. Let's do a beta oxidation again. So it's gonna shorten by two carbons again. So now this double bond's gonna be at carbon five. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay. 
And so this is carbon five, this is carbon eight, and this is carbon 14, right? Well, let's, and actually I generated an F, ADH2, an NADH, and an acetyl-CoA. Let's do another round, because we can still do that, right? So I'm gonna do another round of beta oxidation, and I'm gonna shorten it by two carbons again. So it's gonna be at carbon three. And so now, this is at carbon three, this is carbon six, and this is carbon 12. Okay, so now, and, and, and let, me, let me do this. I generate an FADH2, an NADH, and an acetyl-CoA. Now, this right here is where it gets interesting because now I'm gonna to have to use a completely different set of enzymes. And the, the next enzyme we're gonna use, we actually saw in the last video, and this enzyme is called delta-3, delta-2, enoyl coa isomerase and remember what this enzyme does it essentially takes the the cis bond between carbons three and four and turns it into a trans bond between carbons two and three so you're going to end up with something that looks like this so this double bond is still at carbon six right so one two three four five six and then let's see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, so this still has twelve carbons. This is still carbon six, but now this is carbon two and this is carbon three. And now what you you, you see? Okay, well now we're in the conformation and the the type of fatty acid that can undergo beta oxidation. But notice, and actually let me draw this real quick. Actually, let me well let me just go ahead and say it right now. Notice that we got that double bond there without fatty acyl CoA dehydrogenase. And that was the FAD dependent enzyme, right? So notice we completely bypassed that enzyme. So we end up not producing an FADH2. But notice if we if we still do beta oxidation, we're still going to shorten by two carbons. So this double bond is going to be at carbon four. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, yeah. One, two, three, four. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So now this is carbon 4, this is carbon 10, and what did we generate? Well, we, we didn't generate an FADH2, but we generated an NADH and an acetyl-CoA. Okay, so now, now we're going to do the initial oxidation in beta oxidation. We're going to do the initial oxidation, and that's with FADH2. So we're going to generate an FADH2. Um, well, it uses FAD, but it's going to generate an FADH2. And so what we're going to get is this. We're going to get that trans bond in there, right? So this is carbon 3. This is carbon 4. So we're going to get something that looks like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? So this is carbon 2. This is carbon 3. This is carbon 4. And this is carbon 10. Okay. Now, you might be tempted to say, oh, well, this is just going to do beta oxidation again, but it turns out that it doesn't. In fact, this process, it actually does a different enzyme, and this enzyme has a special name. It's called uh, 2,4-dienoyl. It's enoyl because it has two, it's, it's a dialkene, dienoyl-CoA reductase, and this enzyme is NADPH dependent. Notice the P, it's a it's phospho NADP or phospho NAD, and it burns the NADPH and, rege and regenerates NADP plus. Now, this should tell you something. Number one, that the cell doesn't want to have to do this very much. If, if, if you're you know, if you want to supply, if, if you're going to be oxidizing fat, you want to be oxidizing saturated fat. NADPH is a molecule, it's a very precious reductant that's used for biosynthesis reactions. If you don't want to have to use it, you don't want to have to use it. So essentially, if you can avoid oxidizing this for energy, you want to avoid it. Um, essentially, this is sort of a waste. Number one, because you're burning an NADPH, but also because we bypass generating FADH2. And we bypass it, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in purple, I'm going to show the steps that we bypassed the FADH2. So we bypassed it at that point, and now we just wasted an NADPH. So, but anyways, the product of this reaction, essentially you can think about it like this. 
you have two double bonds and essentially this enzyme is going to reduce half of each double bond and combine them into one double bond. So it's going to look something like this. Okay, and the double bond is going to be at position three, and it's going to be a trans double bond. So one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So now we have the double bond at carbon three, and here's carbon ten, right? So now we're going to use enoyl CoA isomerase to get it in the right position at carbon two or the beta, actually, yeah, the alpha carbon, between the alpha carbon and the beta carbon. So this is enoyl CoA isomerase. And so it's going to generate something that you should recognize from beta oxidation. It's an enoyl CoA. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we got 10 carbons. Here's carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 10, and we're all happy, right? So now this thing's going to go into normal beta oxidation. And so with one round of beta oxidation, we're going to shorten it by two carbons. We're going to generate what? We're going to generate, we're going to generate an NADH in this process, right? We're going to generate an NADH. We're going to generate acetyl CoA. So we're going to shorten by two carbons, so we're going to end up with an eight carbon fatty acid. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is carbon number eight. Now, and now you you know what what happens. We're gonna un, we're gonna do f basically three rounds of beta oxidation, right? So I can cleave right there, right there, and right there. So I'm going to end up generating four acetyl CoA, right? Four acetyl CoA. That's going to be three NADH, right? And it's going to be 3-FADH2, right? So now what we have to do is we really have to just tally our total. So let, let, let's make a table. Let's make a table. Let's make a table. So here's going to be acetyl-CoA. Here's FADH2 and here's NADH, right? So let's come over here. Let's come over here and, and, and regroup. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mark them in yellow. So here, let's do FADH2 first because that's usually the most difficult one. So here's one, two, three, right? But then we bypassed it, right? Then we bypassed one of them, right? Then we did a round of beta oxidation. Then we got another one. So there's four, right? We keep following our work, right? So we had four. And then we got three more. So FADH2, we got seven, right? In terms of NADH, let's go back. In terms of NADH, let's do that in, in this blue color. We got one, two, three, right? One, two, three. Here's a fourth one, right? Keep following our work. We got four, and then five, and then six, seven, eight. So we got eight NADHs. And in terms of, in terms of, um, Acetyl-CoA, all we need to do is figure out the total number of carbons, assuming it's even number, and it's 18, and just divide by 2. And so the total number of acetyl-CoA is 9. Now there is one other consideration we have to take, and actually some, some people will actually say that we got 7 NADHs. But that's not technically correct. They'll say, oh, we got set, we only got seven NADHs. Well, the reason they say that is because we burned an NADPH, right? We burned an NADPH. So if I come over here with another tally, right? Let's make another one and say this is NADPH. So we'll put a P there. It's going to be minus one, right? So we actually generated eight NADHs, but we lost an NADPH. And some people will actually kind of combine those two, even though they are biochemically different molecules. Okay. So what did we see in the oxidation of this fatty acid? Well, we saw that we actually lose one FADH2. We get one less FADH2 than if we were to simply, um, you know, um, oxidize what? If we were to oxidize um, 18 carbons, would be stearate. If we were to oxidize this completely saturated stearate, we would have gotten what? Eight FADH2s, right? We would have gotten eight FADH2s, but we saw we only got seven, and that's because there was the double bond in there. 
Um, the other thing that makes this sort of a waste of a pathway is we have to burn an NADPH. And it probably isn't apparent to you in Biochem 1 yet, but in a lot of bio, in, in uh, lots of biosynthetic reactions, you, you have to use NADPH. So you're essentially wasting it on this. And it, it, if you had to choose between oxidizing saturated fat and unsaturated fat, you would definitely want to go with saturated fat because you get the maximum FADH2. And of course, in the case of saturated fat, you don't have to waste an NADPH. So this is our tally for linoleic acid. So I hope this video helped. Um, see you in the next video.